All right, we're gonna be using an 18 by 24 sheet of paper. Um, this will be our final paper that we're gonna transfer our grid uh, face over onto. Um, what you're gonna do is you're gonna partner up with somebody and you're using two rulers. You're gonna line up the rulers on the edge of the paper. One of the persons is gonna do that. They're gonna hold it. And then the second person is gonna hold a sharpened pencil along the edge and create a line. Then the rulers get moved over to that line. We look both ways to make sure it's truly lined up. That person holds the rulers down and lets the other person know it's okay to make a line and they go ahead and do that. Now, for the sake of this video, I've actually drawn the lines far too dark. When you're doing this correctly, the lines that you draw should be what I call ghost light. If I held it up at the front of the room, you should have a really hard time seeing it at the back of the room. I'm gonna draw a couple lines really, really light, and I'm not even sure the camera is gonna be able to pick up on them because they are so light. I don't know if you can see that or not. The reason that we work light is because at the end, you're gonna to have to erase out the grid. You don't really wanna see a person's face with a grid on top of it. We get rid of most of that evidence. The other thing is if you make a mistake, it's very easy to erase. So we're gonna continue using the two rulers while one person holds the rulers, the other person strikes a line. You're gonna go all the way across in one direction and then all the way across in the other direction. I'm almost done on this side, so I'm restarting my video. Again, having somebody hold the rulers definitely helps them from sliding, especially if you've not done this every day for your life for the last 30 years. Now, something you will notice is sometimes, depending on the width of the rulers and everything, you may have one line of squares that is a little too small or maybe even a little too big. Don't worry about that right now because we can use a magical thing called a scissor and cut off any extra rows that aren't um, appropriate to the image that you're using. We also need to make sure that the number of squares that you have on your final paper is the same number of squares that you have on your grid face. So in my example with the picture with Malala, um, I can count across one, two, three, four, five, six, seven squares. So I orient my paper the same way that I have my grid going. So we have seven here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So I know I need to get rid of one row. So I'm gonna look at this row, and I'm gonna look at this row, and decide which one do I feel is more perfect. And I think my first row is best, so I know I can cut off that row. Then we look at the height of the image. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 10 is kind of missing, so I don't need to even worry about that. So I count on here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So that means I can get rid of both of these rows at the bottom. So what I'm gonna do is use a scissor and go along that edge as carefully as I can. And I can even put a piece of masking tape here so I know I can ignore these squares. And then I have a one-to-one -one ratio. Each one square here is gonna be represented by another square here. So I've cut my paper. Um, so I have the exact same number of squares, seven across here, seven here, nine going across here, and nine going across there. Again, I could use a piece of masking tape to cut off this row so I don't accidentally start you know, paying attention to that one. Now, most people, when they want to transfer a design or draw, feel like it's best to draw the image upside right. And that does make sense. It's kind of the way we see the world. But there is some scientific evidence um, that if you work upside down, that it slows the brain down and makes it actually a little bit more accurate as you draw. There's a famous book called Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain that did some of this. Um, and we found that the drawings that students did when they worked upside down came out much more accurately. And we think it's because your brain slows down to see the actual shapes that are in there as opposed to just drawing a football shape for the eye. When you look at it upside down, it's a little unfamiliar to your brain, so it slows you down to kind of notice what's going on in there. So we're gonna do this upside down, and we're gonna go one square at a time. This square has nothing in it, so it's done. I could put a little X in there if I want to, a little dot, or I can just leave it alone. The next one, I see over here 
that uh, Malala's headdress, if I have this is halfway, hers is about a little bit before a quarter of the way. And that's in the second square over. So second square over, that's halfway. That's a quarter. And hers is a little bit more than a quarter. So I'm going to make a mark there where it exits the box. And then over here, here's halfway. I would say that's about a third of the distance of that square. So I go ahead and look at that. That's halfway. That's about a third. And then I look at the curve that goes here. It's not a straight across line. It's a bit of a curve. And actually, it has a little dimple on the edge. It's very, very subtle. So I go ahead and I kind of capture that angle that I see. Little dimple and then make that curve. So that's all I see in that box. So I'm done. The next one, well, we know where it starts and then ends right about the halfway mark. Also, we have a little edge of her headdress coming over here, but we have a little bit of a detail and then a little edge where her hair meets. So I'm going to go ahead and designate those two in my drawing. So this little decorative piece is about halfway again, and it's about that thick. And we know it's going to exit uh, on the bottom edge a little bit halfway. It's where part of the decoration goes and a little bit more where the other part of the decoration goes. And then this corner where her hair is showing, that's going to be right over about here. So I'm going to draw in the hair. I'm going to draw in the edge where the decoration goes. And a little bit here. And actually, if I'm going to be accurate, kind of bumps up and then bumps down a little bit. Okay. And notice I'm keeping my lines light. So it's very, very easy to kind of erase and make corrections if I need to. So that square is done. I go to the next one. We know where this is. We know where this is. We know where hair enters. So we got to figure out where do things touch, touch on the other side. So about a quarter of the way is where the headdress goes. Okay. The decoration kind of makes an M shape or a W because I'm working upside down. And it goes almost into that corner. Try and echo that. And then here's that little decorative piece. Okay, and then the hair goes across and almost into that corner pretty much. And I'm done with that one. Next one, very easy. I know that this decoration just goes over into the corner. And the headdress goes over to about the halfway mark. So I go ahead and extend that out. Nothing here, nothing here. I'm done with the first row. Since there's nine squares done, I'm already 10%, more than 10% done with my drawing. I'm going to keep doing this going row by row, handling the image as I go. As I continue, I'm really looking at the angles that I'm seeing. I'm not drawing all of the hairs in her head. Um, I'm just trying to catch the thinness and thickness of the little decoration going around her head, but I'm only handling um, the main details and I'm not looking too much at teeny tiny little details. In the hair, uh, I could capture maybe some of the main chunks that I see going on there. And one of the little tricks I use is to actually use a, um, a Sharpie marker and you can outline the main things uh, that you see happening within the texture. And that way you can handle just those things and you can kind of ignore the rest. So if you need some detail, uh, a couple of little shapes that way will be helpful. When you get to areas like the eyes, the nose, and the mouth, I have another helpful hint that's going to help you out quite a bit. These areas have a lot of detail in them. Most of them do not. Here it's just a line, here it's two lines. But when you get to the eyes and the nose and the mouth, that's what makes the person look like that person. So what I have my students do is go ahead and divide up the eyes when they get to it into four pieces. Now sometimes the eyes will be in two squares instead of one. I just happen to get lucky here. Same thing for the nose. And it's these eyes, nose, and mouth that make the person look like that person. It gives that, that sense of uh, correctness about the drawing. So I need to make sure that I'm very careful that those same squares are the ones that I'm handling over here. 
I started on this square, now I'm going to be moving over to her eyes. So I go ahead and put in that little uh, plus sign in there. I don't necessarily need a ruler. If I want one though, I can use it. Same thing here. Again, notice I'm working very, very light. The camera night might not even be picking it up. Again for the nose, and then again for the mouth. This way, when I look at the eye, I only have to deal with one quarter at a time. So I can see that the upper lid of her eye crosses about halfway. There's a little fold above her eye that's going to be slightly above there. And then her eyebrow peeks a little bit into this on this angle. I try and get the width. We know that the eye hits over on this side, right below the line. I know that the eyelid on the bottom is crossing through the halfway mark. And I'm kind of drawing in the angle that I see it crossing in. The corner of her eye is right about here, about a third of the way over. So that's about a third. And it's a little bit up from there. Now I have some dots I can kind of start to connect. So I try and catch the angles that I see in her eye. I see here is kind of a straight edge and then a curve. So I capture that straight edge and then throw in the curve. I catch that uh, fold above her eye. I call that a character line. It kind of tells you again a little bit about the person and their emotions. Sometimes that line is parallel. Sometimes it actually changes a bit along the way. And then that's the other side of her eye. Eyebrow comes across. She's got strong eyebrows, strong character face. Down a little, back up a little, and then over to that corner. And then I try and capture the center of the eye. Notice that her the color of the eye touches both the bottom lid and the top lid. And I see it kind of almost all of it is inside this square, but it, it does cross over a little bit on that middle line. I try and remember that the pupil will always be seen. Pupil is too small or too big, it'll look, really look odd. And I can put in a little, little shape for where I'm going to keep the shine later on. And then I can go ahead and throw in some of the eyelashes, but look at the direction that they move. Um, these are not going to be permanent, they're just sort of like reminders for me when I go over this later with color, the direction that I see things going. I'm just kind of capturing the direction, and that way I'll know which way I want to do my brush strokes. So as you continue, when you get to difficult areas, go ahead and break them down into smaller pieces, and then they're much easier to handle.